Okay, turn your Bibles to Jonah, chapter 4. You know, when you <clears throat> study Hebrew, um, the Hebrew Bible starts at the back. So a lot of times when you see uh, teachings that are found in the Old Testament, the main purpose uh, is seen towards the end instead of the beginning, which is opposite of what the Greek is. So um, we want to look at uh, Jonah, and I want to preach on the subject of a prepared God. He's prepared to, and his purpose to save sinners and to send his uh, prophets into the land to preach the gospel of salvation to the Ninevites. In the fourth chapter here, we're going to turn and look into it. And You know, I've studied this book many times, and I've seen these things here, but it didn't all come in and click like it uh, has for this message tonight. A prepared God uh, is, uh, is a very important sovereign God. He says in verse 1 here, But it pleased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now, he was angry because God saved 60,000 people, and they had a big revival and, and everything. So I'm starting here to show you the attitude, the pride, the arrogancy, uh, and the things, and you understand the rest of it when we get into it there, when we come down uh, to the message uh, as it is. He goes on and says here, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before, and uh, I fled before unto Tarsus, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. In other words, he had a confrontation with God in the first call. And of course, I believe there's two calls involved here. The worst one, the first one, was uh, not. Uh, the effectual call, it was, uh, and again, it's parallel in showing you what happens in the different calling. When God effectually calls uh, someone to preach, that affects the last uh, until the Lord decides to change that and usually it's till death. So we find the importance of what he's going to uh, show us in the scriptures here. And again, we're going to see that Jonah is going to... Uh, uh, to play out his attitude. He had great pride and arrogancy here. And, uh, and the salvation that you're going to hear him cry out for, I believe, is also a secondary area there that he had to accept that God was in control of the salvation. And uh, he's going to do his purpose and plan to save sinners. And these Ninevites were going to be saved. So in seeing a prepared God... Uh, let's go over to the first chapter now and get into uh, what he's, uh, what he's uh, uh, about to do uh, for the Ninevites. In verse 1, he says, How uh, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, a great city, and cry uh, uh, against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. So we see in verse 1, there is a prepared prophet. He went to him and gave a call to him. Now, the call, when it is a general call, is not effective as the effective call. I guess that's probably logical, but uh, uh, we see here he went to, uh, and it really he's rehearsing what he said in the fourth chapter there, uh, and, and the reaction of him in this. There was no submission there. There was no uh, willingness to... Uh, obey or anything of this nature that is a part of the effectual call. But the, we see him receiving the call here, and then we see that there's a prepared people. Now, you're going to see some of these uh, preparedness of, of God. Uh, he's being prepared to be revealed in others that he didn't reveal. So God's purpose is working in the unseen area as well as the revealed area. And what we have in the scriptures is what <coughs> what uh, Jonas was uh, uh, was uh, uh, accountable to in this uh, section here, and we find that the Ninevites they were a horrible people. 
they ravished the Jews. They uh, probably, if uh, I was there, I probably would have probably done the same thing. You don't know that because they persecuted, they ravished, they raped, they destroyed, they killed, they murdered, and all the Jews, they hated them. And so he's getting uh, Jonah, the uh, son of Amittai, uh, to go and preach the gospel and preach judgment upon the nation of uh, Nineveh. And he's going to call for them to repent in this. Now, we find here in this section here, I want to go over now as we see the general call. And the first one, the, the effectual call comes in uh, on this uh, third chapter and verse 1. Now, you see the same thing, but you're going to see something that God does here to make sure that uh, Jonah gets the impact of this call. He says in verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, in the Old Testament, the Spirit did not was not embedded in the heart and the soul of uh, the pro uh, prophets. It came and went. And when it was upon them, they obeyed. When it was not, they did not obey. And that's the benefit that you and I have because we have the Spirit within us that is going to be able to uh, be with us and to take those things and uh, bring them to completion. And Jonah, uh, uh, we find here, he says, Arise, go into Nineveh, in verse 2 there, that great city, and preach unto it the, the preaching that I bid thee. Now this was not in the first call, and uh, this was more of a forceful call, and that's why I believe it's an effective call. He was going to bring, preach a message, so he has a message that has been set up by God, and he said, I'm going to bid you to preach this. And he goes on in verse, uh, uh, verse 3 there, And Jonah rose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. Now, we find that in God's preparedness and his purpose to save sinners, the Ninevites, we see several things here. And secondly, that not only does he have a people, uh, but they're evil and totally depraved, and uh, they need to be saved. And uh, later on, uh, Nineveh was um, actually uh, created a problem, and, and uh, God had to destroy the uh, Ninevites. But we find here that he prepared uh, in chapter 1 now, back to chapter 1 and verse 4, we find here that the Lord sent out a great wind upon the sea. Now, Jonah was given the call, but Jonah went down, and uh, when you backslide, you're always going down. You're going away from God, and we find here he went and fled to Tarshish, and, and by the way, uh, the devil was hint, trying to hinder the gospel going to the, to the Ninevites, and uh, he supplied the city, and, and uh, Jonah paid for his own fee, for, uh, fare there, but he got free fare later on, uh, but it was not the kind that he wanted. But he goes on and says here, and he went down to Joppa, and he found the ship going to Tarsus, uh, so he paid the fare thereof and went down onto it to go with them into Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. Now, where can you get out of the presence of the Lord? See, Jonah was not spiritually being led here. See, when the Spirit of God calls a, a prophet in to go into the land, there is, there is a awakening to the reality, the purpose and plan that God has for him to fulfill. We find here that uh, he's trying to get out of the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is everywhere. <laughs> uh, you can go into the deepest hell and he's there. You can go into the highest heavens, he's there. And uh, we know that uh, he's going to do his purpose and plan whatsoever he chooses to. So we find here that he sent a powerful storm uh, and, of course, the victims uh, that were on this ship, uh, and you see the unconcern that he has because he went down in the ship and went to sleep. And, of course, the, 
ran down because they were afraid. And again, uh, something that I didn't pick up in studying certain times, that uh, he had actually already told them on the ship that he was fleeing the, from the presence of the Lord. And, uh, and, and that is uh, why things were happening. Look at verse 9, and he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, uh, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. Now, he, he goes to the ability of God's creation here. You see him controlling. He sent. Uh, he had prepared, and, and uh, I believe that the storm wasn't prepared on the scene uh, to catch God off guard. It was prepared for, for the foundations of the world and the purpose and plan for Jonah's ministry to the Ninevites. And he says here in the Mariners, they were afraid in verse 5, uh, and they uh, it got them all shook up, and they was gone, got religious all at once, and they made their vows and all this type of thing. But it's interesting here that they cast, they cast lots and uh, gambled, and, uh, and even uh, that was against Jonah because it came up, and he was the one that was... Uh, was uh, left there to take the brunt. So we find that Jonah uh, said that he was the problem family, and they asked him, well, what can we do? He said, well, you take me and throw me into the sea. In uh, chapter 2 here, <coughs> he says here, um, chapter 1, rather, and he said unto them, like, lift me up and cast me, in verse 12 of chapter 1, and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Now we see that Jonah's coming aware of what he's done. He's, uh, and he uh, didn't want someone else being persecuted uh, for uh, his uh, rebellion and, uh, and, and actually a lack of... Uh, uh, fulfilling his responsibility as a prophet to, to Nineveh. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. Now you notice here, they, uh, they got the problem solved, and, uh, but they didn't know the God that was dealing with uh, Jonah, so they tried to take things in their own hands and try to roar away, and they could not. They couldn't even go anywhere and we find here that they could not, for the sea was wrought, in verse 13, there in the tempest against them. Wherefore they uh, cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, we beseech thee, let us not perish uh, for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, have done it to, uh, as it pleased thee. And verse 15, And they took up Jonah and cast him into the sea, and the sea... Uh, uh, ceased from its raging, and then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. And the Lord uh, prepared a great fish. Now, this fish was on a on a uh, pattern and, and a destination to swallow a prophet. Um, you can see God in control of all of the things that round. Jonah's rebellion, and uh, he's prepared the consequences for Jonah for, uh, for not uh, yielding to the call to go to Nineveh. And he said, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, this is important here because Jonah was an unlikely uh, prophet that would be used as a great sign for, for the um, uh, for the last days uh, when uh, the Jesus Christ would go to the cross there. And, of course, this was a prophetic call, and it would be a sign to the Jews here. Look over oh, Matthew chapter 12, if you would. Matthew chapter 12, in verse 39 through verse 41. Matthew 12, uh, 39 through 41. And, you know, when God, people are looking in the stars for signs now. Astrology is one of the biggest, uh, I think everybody I've ever worked with 
they look at their astronomy before they ever leave the house to find out what's going to happen that day. And of course, that's not, that's not giving honor and glory to God because he has those things set up for that day. And it goes in verse, uh, the uh, 12th chapter, verse 39. He says here in verse 39, uh, But he answered and said unto them, An evil generation, uh, adulterous generation, seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given him but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Now, the, this, uh, Matthew writes a whale's belly, and uh, I don't have any problems by reading what the scriptures say, but we see that in the Old Testament, it was the great fish there. So, shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the, in the heart of the earth? Now, we go into the burial of Jesus Christ. Now, the very heart of the gospel is that when Jesus cried and went in, uh, uh, died and went into the grave, uh, there was a, uh, a time that he was there, and it was three days and three nights. It wasn't a day and a half. And it, if I, when I look at the scriptures, if you look at a gospel that uh, is centered around the death, burial, and resurrection in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it says there that Jesus, what, he died and was buried according to the scripture. And, uh, and he arose again the third day. And the third day is the third day. So that makes him being crucified on a, a late Wednesday night and uh, rising early uh, on the uh, first day of the week. And, of course, that's an important factor of the gospel. When you, when you change the truth of God, you change it into a lie that Matthew says. So many people have a gospel that's not totally... Uh, uh, in line with the scriptures and of course these are three little days 72 hours is what was involved here and of course Jonah with even in his rebellious uh, attitude and and, uh, and his uh, ministry to the Ninevites and how that he did what he did uh, God uh, used him as an example of a prophetic uh, acknowledgement of the death burial resurrection of Jesus Christ and his death in the grave before he come forth uh, was three days and three nights. Now, not only was there a storm and a great fish brought forth, we find here that when, when he came forth out of the grave, now, about um, 20 years ago, I guess it's been now, they uh, had found a uh, whale or a uh, yeah, a whale that had uh, had a, a person inside it. And uh, when they were in there three days and three nights, the digestive juices begin to uh, work upon the skin and, and pulling the, uh, and beginning to dissolve the body so that they can digest what they swallow. And of course, uh, with him being in there three days and three nights, uh, he, when uh, the, uh, when he, he was spewed out upon the, on land uh, here. And, and, and let's go to chapter 2, verse 1 there. And Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his uh, God out of the belly, fish's belly, and uh, said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and they heard me out of the belly of hell, uh, carried I, and thou heardest my voice. He says, for thou has cast me into the deep, in the midst of the sea, and, uh, and the floods compassed me about, all the, thy billows and thy waves passed over me, and I said, I cast out of thy sight, yet I will look uh, again towards the holy temple. Now, you remember this is a saying that Daniel did. He went and looked toward Jerusalem, the holy temple, and prayed. So now we find Jonah getting serious about things. And it took some uh, pressures by God and providential uh, uh, dealings with the, uh, with the prophet here. And he says here, And the waters come past me about, and even uh, to, to the soul, uh, the depth closed me, uh, closed me 
round about, the weeds were wrapped around my head. This is a scene of him being in the belly. Now, this seems to indicate that, uh, and I did some uh, looking up of a uh, sperm whale, uh, the uh, taking the end of the water in the mouth and then spewing out the top. And this could have been the way, uh, because when he spewed uh, Jonah out of his belly, uh, he came hit uh, on dry land and was uh, running towards Nineveh to preach the gospel like he's supposed to. Waters confessed me about it. goes on in verse 6. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with the bars uh, was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my uh, life from corruption, O Lord my God. Uh, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer uh, came in unto thee and unto thy holy temple. Now, we find him praying twice, but this time uh, there's going to be, a, there must have been a change in, uh, and I believe that he's, re this is a process of repentance, uh, and uh, and God is recognizing this, and they, that observed lying vanities forsake their own mercy. For I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that I have uh, uh, vowed salvation is the Lord. Now, truly salvation is of the Lord, and it, it, it's in the uh, factual working upon lost sinners. And uh, Jonah was a prophet, and he was a uh, righteous man. So we find there's a twofold application here. The application is that Jonah really realized that that God had a right to take his salvation and send him to preach to the people that he purposed to preach to that they would be saved. And, of course, the, the scriptures always have two meanings uh, in this. And he says, And if the Lord spake unto the fish and vomited out uh, Jonah upon dry land. And, of course, I think that he had the signs of his consequences when he went in. Can you imagine walking up to a guy that was white in color and he's preaching the God, uh, preaching uh, the judgment upon the uh, Ninevites in 40 days? Uh, well, this is what was taking place. Now, verse 3, And the word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time. And again, this is, uh, this is important because when he is sent there, he's got a message in this situation that God has prepared for him and he's got to preach that message. And we have a definite commission to preach the gospel to every creature uh, as uh, Christians and preachers and missionaries and, and churches. And uh, the things that we have to do uh, uh, is the purpose of God and salvation. So the plan is there and, and the purpose is uh, in that he uh, prepared all these here things to get the gospel to the Ninevites. You stop and think of your life. Uh, how he uh, worked in that, and of course the uh, we were on the condemnation of sin, and then the Lord saved us, and then the things that we weren't doing before we are now doing, and and that's a great blessing for us. So we find uh, in this, and of course uh, when we get back over to chapter four, there we find him pouting, pouting because God did what He said He's going to do, but. Before we get there, let's get see how many that was uh, saved there. I think it was sixty thousand there, uh, in, uh, in that uh, had come to the saving knowledge of the Lord there and spared it. The king and all of his house and everyone. Okay, let's continue on chapter four here and uh, and uh, see the importance of what is going to transpire here uh, in this. And again. Uh, we find that God, uh, he's out here pouting, and God's going to prepare a gourd. Now, this is a, uh, a pomocrest. It's a great big elephant-type leaf that come up over him. And, of course, uh, the heat in uh, Israel's time, uh, especially the uh, east wind, uh, is very powerful. And we find here that there is a necessity uh, for this to... Uh, to uh, show mercy even in even in uh, Jonah's backslidden condition God showed mercy on him but he's going to show him 
that he's in control of that because he turns around and prepares a worm uh, in the next uh, day or the night that eat up the pomegranate, uh, pomegranate and to show uh, Jonah that um, he has a responsibility uh, to accept what God has uh, wanted for his life. Because his attitude, as we've seen in chapter 4 to be in in verse 2 there, he, uh, he just kind of defied the Lord, said that uh, I told you that I, what you was going to do, and, and I told you I'm going to Tarsus. And there's a lot of Christians telling God what to do today with their life. And they, they better not, uh, 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 they better not uh, continue that because if he's actually effectually called them unto salvation, they belong to him and he's going to do with them whatsoever he pleases and he will make it uh, a purpose and plan for their life. So we find the worm showed that there, only the comfort would be temporary because Jonah was in direct disobedience and rebellion uh, even though he did submit it was almost in a way that was uh, not a, a pleasing to the Lord but still the Lord's purpose was performed there in this now he goes on in verse 8 of the fourth chapter there and it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind now this is a silent wind that comes out of the east and it's very hot and he says here and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished he to himself to die and said it's better for me to die than to live now he said this earlier <clears throat> when uh, he was trying to get out of his responsibility now God had blessed him they had uh, had gone to Nineveh and uh, as I said there were uh, 60,000 I think in Ninevites that were uh, saved uh, in verse 11 there and uh, and the king and all this, but we find here that God blessed the word. Uh, he just has instruments to use that, and and uh, and we find here that uh, we have really no credit that we can take ourselves because it's God who is uh, doing what He purposed in our lives, and and it's the power of God in the salvation. Romans chapter one verse sixteen. Uh, in uh, in the gospel as it goes forth. So we find here, and God said to Jonah, Dost thou well to be angry with the gourd? And he said, I do well to be uh, angry even unto death. Uh, he was he was really, <laughs> he, he was, he rather had died than to see these Ninevites saved. Now, You'd be surprised at the, how that some Christians will go out and they won't witness to a uh, individual that uh, has a different color skin or has a different religion or they're kind of odd, even homosexuals and and uh, whores and, uh, and the different things that are out there. But the the Lord it shows us in Jonah that God, if He's purposed to save a people and He's sending us to go there, and that's here at West Jefferson, uh, that the gospel go forth to those that are here. So he must have some people in this city that we need to take the gospel to, and that's a, a wonderful blessing. He has placed the building here. He's placed the members in the body that she, he has added to it, and uh, we are to uh, be accountable to taking the gospel, just like old Jonah was to, to the... Uh, Ninevites, and he goes on and says here, uh, then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd. We, we, you see, Jonah's spirituality was showing pity on the wrong objects. Instead of pity on the Ninevites because they were dying and going to hell and needed to be saved, he had the gospel, uh, he had the uh, uh, preach the word of that they needed to repent because 40 days the Lord was going to come and to uh, uh, destroy them. And they responded and repented 
and God uh, showed mercy upon them. And, and he goes on, it says here, he says, he says in verse 11, and should not I spare Nineveh, the great city? Now that great city was not, not necessarily saying that the city was great in uh, riches and, and uh, wealth and all this, even though it may have been, but he's talking about their sinful condition. It came up before God and God had to send a prophet there. And he says here, we're in more than six, six score. Uh, that's, uh, I think a score is 10, uh, 10 years uh, or 10. And, uh, and so it's uh, 60,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. And that's what the condition of those that are spiritually dead. They don't understand. They didn't seek God. They don't know God. They didn't know which way is what. And also uh, much cattle. Now this always puzzled me why the cattle were put in there. Uh, but that uh, was it is there. So we find that little did Jonah know that he was going to be used as an example. Now God can use anybody for an example. Uh, he's used different ones throughout the Bible uh, as examples. And in this case, uh, the example was not to the greatest degree of fulfilling the purpose of God until God took charge and brought it to uh, fruition, uh, we find that God uh, did do and save those that they were supposed to go, that Jonah was supposed to go to. So we find here that uh, the purpose of God was fulfilled, but the greater purpose was to be an example of uh, uh, Christ being in the grave three days and three nights. And without the gospel, and of course the resurrection it was at that 72 hour and it was a uh, it was a sign to uh, the Jews and uh, the uh, people today are looking more for signs than they are for the coming of the Lord and and I think that we as Christians have that great responsibility um, to do that and so Jonah is a great example of what God's going to do regardless uh, if we rebel against him whatever it is and because he is, he is God. He is the Lord, and he is uh, all-powerful. He's all-knowing and all-present. You can't get out of his presence. You can run when the Lord's working for you. Uh, salvation and the calling or whatever it may be, he's going to deal with that because he is God. And, of course, I hope the Lord blesses you with this. I'm kind of new at this here.